when I was in training as an intern, we could not care for babies that were less than about three pounds. So they typically were uh, kept comfortable, but for the most part went on to die because we, A, didn't have the knowledge, and B, certainly didn't have the equipment we needed to take care of them. That uh, cut off, if you will now, for when we think we can do things and when we can't is down to a, uh, about a pound, around four or five hundred grams. So it's been a dramatic change in 20 years over um, at least the size of babies that we're capable of taking care of. Here at VCU, we're one of the first in the country to be able to provide ECMO. ECMO is extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And what ECMO is, it's a life-sustaining therapy for infants who are born with really um, troublesome diagnoses such as meconium aspiration or congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And these children are, um, through very much a huge team, um, put on heart-lung bypass to buy us time so that the heart and lungs can potentially heal. Um, it takes a huge number of people, um, from nurses to physicians to surgeons to technicians. A large volume of people are required to um, sustain a program and a facility uh, where we can provide ECMO. But there are um, a large team of people who are involved in, in, in intensive care, particularly of babies. Once a week, for example, we have something called interdisciplinary rounds where you have occupational therapists, physical therapists, nutritionists, pharmacists, social workers, discharge planners, nurses, docs, chaplains, and anybody else who needs to, who's involved in the care of the babies to come together and see each baby to, to, to interact. And you look around and see how many people are involved and, and you know, yeah, I know what each one of them does, and yes, when I am the attending for, for, the, for the baby, I, I am, again, overall responsible, but I can't do what each of them does, and the fact is that they do it, and they do it very well here. One of the reasons it's difficult for mothers to um, breastfeed a preterm infant is because they often have to pump milk for a long time. Now with this new unit, we have increased and greater opportunities for mothers to do that because each baby has their own room. It's comfortable for moms and dads. They can come and spend the night. Mom can store her breast milk in a refrigerator in the baby's room. So it's always available for the baby to have. In the early days of neonatal intensive care, we were so concerned with making sure they could breathe and keep their temperature up and not get infected by being in the world that feeding was sort of secondary and down the line and a lot of babies uh, would not have survived to the point that we even needed to worry about that. But now we have little babies born very young and very small and we start thinking about the best way to feed those babies both nutritionally and from a developmental perspective. From a nutritional perspective we start feeding these babies within two or three days of birth, but we're feeding them through a tube so that they get the calories they need to grow. Babies start sucking and swallowing when they're still in their mother's womb. Even preterm infants have the ability to suck and swallow, but what they don't have the ability to do is to suck, swallow, and breathe. So this particular apparatus that we have on this uh, on this bottle has a, a pressure gauge inside it and that's what allows us to measure sucking. All of the data are being directly recorded into a computer so we'll have a heart rate and um, respiratory rates and sucking and swallowing and breathing so we'll be able to look at um, based on this baby's um, readiness indicators how well the baby actually feeds. She really hard to break. You can be here for about 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm real hard to break. The care I have received here has been very thorough. It's more than what I had expected and more than what I thought I would receive had I just gotten care in my own town. I had no knowledge of everything that was going on, especially with my own situation being gestational diabetic. 
for the first time and having high blood pressure with them taking control and telling me what they expected and what I was going through. Whenever I asked questions, they were answered to where I could understand them without having a degree. Today was the first day I got to hold him and feed him, uh -huh. Great. you know, personally. Right. And so this is the first time that you've ever gotten to do what we call kangaroo care. Oh, absolutely. And how does it feel? Oh, it feels great. I'm okay. sure it feels good to him, too, because right. he's not complaining. Uh -huh. And, I, you know, I just feel him breathing on me. And it's that, right. that oneness that I don't mind sharing with him. And another reason why I breastfeed and uh -huh. all those other things, just to get the closeness. That's great. I really enjoy it. Thanks for introducing it to me. This is um, called kangaroo care. And basically, it is where we put the baby directly on your chest, and the baby's upright so that we can monitor their breathing and see how they're reacting to what we're doing. And basically, the baby's directly on your skin, and we use either blankets or, or your blouse to contain the baby. And there's been evidence to support that babies who um, experience kangaroo care they have better weight gain, they digest their foods better, um, it also increases our bonding time. And for moms like yourself who are breastfeeding, it helps stimulate milk production and gets the baby accustomed to you and your body. Yeah, this is great. When I'm able to, I try to come up for um, four to five days a week. I'm here usually Tuesday through Friday. And then I go home Saturday. Well, I go home Friday night and I stay home Saturday. Come back Sunday. And stay home Monday and come back Tuesday. It's what I've been doing. When I'm here, I usually stay for the whole day. So I'll sit and talk to him for a while. And I can see them do his care for when they're feeding him or doing different things. Because he's more, he tends to be more active mm -hmm. when they're messing around. He doesn't like it very much. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to see him do anything, it's usually during that yeah. time. I'm watching them with him, I'm not as afraid to touch him. Because at first I was afraid to touch him because he was so tiny. They were very encouraging and they said it's okay to touch him and they told you how to touch him and, and not to rub him but to just hold your hands steady and, and sometimes he'll grab your finger and sometimes he won't. And he's, he has his own mind even though he's so tiny. I wasn't able to breastfeed so I read to him instead. And then I bring projects, you know, I cross stitch, I, I sometimes sleep because <laughs> I get tired. I have a journal that I write in that I keep. Um, so I, those are the things that I do when I'm here. I called a lot when he was sick, probably you know, every two to four hours. Mm -hmm. And they were really nice about it. They say you can call as much as you want. They've been wonderful. One of the advantages of being born in an academic institution if you have a complex problem like congenital diaphragmatic hernia is that you have all the specialists that you need to deal with the situation. In the past, we thought this was a surgical problem. That is, the congenital diaphragmatic hernia is a hole in the muscle between the abdomen and the chest, and it is the principal muscle we use in breathing. If there's a hole in it, then while the baby is forming, the intestines get into the chest, take up space, and the lungs that are there don't work as well as they ought to. With just that knowledge, the approach used to be to rush to the operating room to get the intestines out of the baby's chest and back in the abdomen where they belong. And the belief was that that was going to make everything better. Well, point of fact, it didn't. We've learned since then that there are many changes that the baby's going through in the first few days of life that are important to having to ultimately having blood flow in the correct direction through the lungs and through the heart. And sometimes we need to help that, and it is when that direction of blood flow is not correct that these babies get into the biggest trouble.